Broadcasting live from the Business Radio X studios in Phoenix, Arizona, it's time for Phoenix Business Radio, spotlighting the city's best businesses and the people who lead them. Welcome, everyone, to Project Management Office Hours, the number one live project management radio show in the U.S., broadcasting you from the Phoenix Business Radio X studios in Tempe, Arizona, and actually coming to you remote today from my home office in Gilbert, Arizona. And we have another UK guest with us that we'll be introducing shortly. Very excited to have him with us. Certainly want to say thank you to our sponsors, the PMO Squad. What an amazing journey the PMO Squad has been on for the past seven plus years. Please visit their website, www.thepmosquad.com, to learn more about the Purpose Driven PMO and all of their project management services. And a reminder that this show, Project Management Office Hours, is going to be recorded. We're live right now, but will be recorded and will be released as a podcast. So you can catch that on all your podcast platforms. And also visit the website, projectmanagementofficehours.com, to check out who we have on all of our upcoming episodes, catch all the past episodes, and learn more about all of our amazing guests. Speaking of guests, I would love to introduce today, Stuart Easton. Welcome, Stuart. Hi, Joe. Good to see you. Great to have you on. I was fortunate enough to be on one of the webinars that you all had put on a few months back. So great to be able to return the favor and have you join me for my show. Excellent. Well, it's fun to see. We're not quite sure whether people will be able to see the video on the, the podcast or not, but behind Joe is a picture of the Red Sox. Uh, we were just talking about that. And uh, what I didn't tell you, Joe, is I lived in Boston oh, going on 11 years or something. So, oh, wow. so uh, that was right around the same time. So uh, there's a little bit of common ground here. We may be separated by about 4,500 miles, but we'll, we'll come together over the Red Sox. Yes, absolutely. Thanks. I did not know that. Great fact. Uh, and, and you continue the string of recent guests that we've had from the UK. We had Suzanne Matson on recently from London. Simon Harris joined us from Scotland, and of course, now you're joining us from Cambridge, I believe. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct. And, and this is, in fact, the first wave of the counter-revolution. It's taken us a couple hundred years to get organized, <laughs> <laughs> but it started here, right on the radio here in Phoenix. <laughs> you're the right group, right? Project management experts coming in organized, ready to take over the world. Well, I'll tell you what, if, if, if we do nothing else than teach you a little bit of the Queen's English today, then we'll have done a good job. Sure. So why don't you, Stuart, take a moment to just introduce yourself to the audience, tell them a little bit about yourself and your organization and how sure, uh, sure. Some, of, some of the fun stuff you have to offer. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm the, one of the founders and, and the CEO of a company called Transparent Choice. Transparent Choice does project prioritization software. So we're a software company. Um, and we, we really work globally. We're based in the UK, but we, we work globally in the, certainly in the US, uh, Canada, Latin America, Asia, uh, Australia, New Zealand. You know, it really is all over the world, uh, which is pretty good for a tiny little crazy software startup out of, out of Cambridge. But I also, I mean, the, the area that we really focused is around, uh, sort of the, the portfolio management, strategic alignment, prioritization, that, that kind of, that kind of stuff, and and uh, you know, I, I guest lecture occasionally on the Master of uh, Major Program Management at the University of Oxford, and things like that. So you know, I've been around a little bit. We get to talk to a, a whole load of really smart PMOs who are really struggling, and and uh, and sometimes we even get to help them, which is which is always a good thing. But what I'd love to do today is you know just explore with you some of the issues that we hear again and again. Especially at the moment, with uh, I mean, we've we've been joking in the in the green room here uh, about you know how crazy the whole COVID situation is, but uh, I think for PMOs and portfolio owners and portfolio managers, it, it uh, and for the executives for whom they work, it represents some real challenges. So maybe we'll touch on some of that as well today. Uh, that that might be an interesting topic. Yes, absolutely, I agree. So you mentioned strategic alignment and portfolios. Why? I mean, obviously, project management spans such a diverse range of topics and fields. Why focus in on those? Well, the, 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 <laughs> it's a very good question, actually. So, there, and there are a couple of a couple of answers to that. 
so if you think about you know delivering projects, the the the, the whole point of a project is to help the business achieve its business goals. Right? So so and, and the point about the word goal is that you're not there yet. So if you're not there yet, you've got to change something, and that change happens through a project. So your ability to influence the business is driven by two things. It's driven by your ability to execute projects well. And this, the second thing is it's driven by uh, the decision you make into which projects you do. So if you're doing the wrong projects but executing them beautifully, flawlessly, you're still not adding value. So to be adding value, you not only have to execute well, but you have to be doing the right things. And the, the team here, uh, the, the founding team, comes from a, a real mishmash of kind of decision science and uh, really looking deeply into how and why uh, decisions get made um, and the research that kind of informs how to do it better. We, we just thought there was, a, there was an opportunity to massively improve the that dimension of you know pick the right things and it, it really is an area that's, that's underserved if you look at most of the ppm tools you know they may have a little a uh, couple of little charts or something but generally they're focused on you know project management project reporting you know that side of things the execution side of things and they generally do a fairly weak job of the portfolio side, the governance selecting projects. So it just seemed like there was a, a huge opportunity to add value there. Yeah, working the right projects at the right time, right? It, it's uh, an it. excellent point. To, you can execute well, and if you're working the wrong things, what's the point? What's the purpose, right? Well, and, 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 it, and it's not just about what's the point in, the ter- in terms of the goals of the organization. You know, the, the webinar we did together the other week on, you know, purpose-driven PMO. Right, that's one of your that's one of your drum beats that you you you're yeah. banging out there. Well, you know, human beings, individuals, like to feel there's some purpose in their life. You know, that was kind of the point of your discussion the other week. And so, if you if you spend you know nine work, months working on a project that just then arbitrarily gets binned, and someone says, "Oh, actually, you know, that project wasn't that important." How do you feel? Does that does that make you feel like you've just added value or working life has meaning? No, of course not. So so it's not just about the business results, it's about the people. Yeah, you know, when you're making an investment in a in a project, you're not just in, investing your organization's money and time, you're investing people's lives. So so you know, I, I kind of think you've got a duty if you're running a portfolio to make sure that that you're adding value, that those people feel like they're adding value in the work they're doing. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I mean, that's the projects don't exist if you don't have people working them, right? I mean, we have to ensure that we have teams that are engaged, you know, aligning with purpose driven PMO. My next topic that I'm bringing to people is empowering people to deliver results, right? And then if we don't do that, if we don't engage them and empower them on work that's going to be relevant and important to the company, well, then again, we're missing the point of of the human existence as well as the organizational existence. So I'm lockstep with you on the strategic alignment and the value of portfolios. Notion of too many PMOs spend too much time chasing paperwork, you know, following rules and process and, and process for its own sake rather than process that actually adds value. And, you know, there are places for process and there are places to give people freedom and to say, look, this is where we're going. You've got a brain, go use it, get us there. I'm in Cambridge right now, and you may have heard there's a there's a little university here. And back in the uh, back in the mid 1800s, there was a guy at uh, I think it was Trinity Hall in Cambridge, uh, a chap by the name of Lord Byron. He's he's a very famous poet of the yeah. time, and he was a bit of a he was a bit of a yeah he was a bit of a scoundrel as well. In the college in, in Trinity, they had a set of rules. You know what? What do people do when they when you when you give them too many rules? So one of the rules was they weren't allowed to have dogs. Right? You couldn't keep a dog in your in your rooms. And this is at a time when you know it was country gentlemen who went to university, and they all had dogs, and they all had the horses, and they all had this. Right? So 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 Byron was not happy about this, but the rules were there. So what did he do? He went out and he looked at the rules, and he he looked at them and he went, well, it doesn't say I can't have a bear. So he <laughs> went out. So he went out and he bought a bear and, and he kept the bear in his in his <laughs> university rooms. But 
So when you when you put too many rules on people, you know, they, they start to do weird things. You know, they, they kind of push back. It's, it's an instinct. They push back against that. I think if you can instill people with a sense of where where the projects are going, where the business is going, where the portfolio is going, then then actually people feel liberated and they feel empowered and they can actually do something to help you get there rather than fighting the system and just you know doing something because they've been told to do it. So there's, there are lots of motivations behind what we do. And some of them are business-driven, some of them are human-driven, and some of them are driven by bears. <laughs> I love. It. Hey, it just it just occurred to me. If you were in Boston, were you in Cambridge district within Boston, or you could be uh, on both both coasts? You were in Cambridge. Well, are you an that's, MIT that's a, guy or a Harvard guy? Right. I mean, if uh, you well, better be an I, MIT guy. Well, I mean, you, you've you've heard the story in Boston, right? Of the the student who goes into the supermarket and uh, he fills his trolley. You know, he's got the he's got the baked beans in there. He's a student. He's got the baked beans in the pasta, and that's about it. And, um, uh, but he's got, you know, 30, 30 items in the trolley and he, but he, he rocks up to the, to the till. Uh, if anybody can remember what it's like to actually go to a supermarket in this, this yeah. day, but you rock up at the till and above the till there's a sign that says, you know, 10 items or less. And, but he's got 30 items in the trolley. So the manager comes up and he says, excuse me, sir, but are you from Harvard and can't count or MIT and can't read? <laughs> and um, so, so, so I actually have not. I, I went to neither, uh, neither MIT nor, nor Harvard, um, but I, I, I did go to Oxford actually. And, okay. Uh, and, uh, we actually moved over to, to the states to for my wife. She was doing a postdoc, and it was it was a huge amount of fun and a great privilege living there. To be honest, it is always fun. I did work in Cambridge, and now I work in the other Cambridge, which is obviously the Cambridge with a river cam and a bridge. Right. Right, yeah, <laughs> where the name comes from. Yeah, so we have the Charles River so, um, for some reason that uh, it's different. Yeah, yeah. which is a great river. I've, 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 I've rode, I've rode, I've rode, I've rode on the Charles and had a great time on there. It's a fabulous, beautiful, impressive river. But uh, but lots and of great universities. The, and for the Queen's English uh, lesson, the trolley is the shopping cart. For us here in the states, of course it is. Of course it is. Yes, yes. You know, I've been back in the UK now for about I think six, seven years or something. So I've, there was this awkward phase where I would speak American and people over here wouldn't un- understand me. And so there you go. I, I must be becoming anglicised again. That's good news. Yeah, that's a small, small victory. <laughs> so one uh, going back to when I did the webinar uh, that you had hosted. I had talked about uh, global success on project management, right? Some of the metrics really have been flat for the past decade, right? We've seen, depending on who you use for your metrics, we're about 50% success rate. Yeah. And that hasn't budged much. And there's this concept of underperformers versus champions. Yeah. What's your take on all of that? And and how does that fit into the, the broader discussion of, alignment and portfolios yeah i mean that's that's a it's a really good question so if if you look at the also the profession data you know from the pmi um you, you're absolutely right i mean the 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 project success rates have been flatlined now for you know around a decade or so and and what was really what was really interesting uh, i was actually at a gartner event a little while ago uh when donna fitzgerald was still kind of running the the show and she she gave this really interesting talk it wasn't that long after we just founded transparent choice when we sat through this and what she what she kind of said is look you know we've we've gone from a state where project failure rates were 30 percent and we've managed to get them up to about 60 65 percent yeah somewhere again depending where you get your data but and then it's flatlined and so we, we got them there. We doubled that success rate through professionalizing the industry, you know, through certifications, through PPM tools to help enforce that, through project management methodologies and things like that. But it's they've kind of deadlined, right? And she said, that, so, so she looked at it and she kind of went, well, I think the thing that matters, the thing that's going to move us beyond that is portfolio management, not project management, but portfolio management. So that's about making sure you're working on the right things. It's, it's about making sure you've got the right uh, amount and type of resources. It's about making sure you're not taking on too much. But if, if you take on too much, 
um, you know, you start time slicing, you start making mistakes, you've got to fix the mistakes, and then before you know it, everything's on the floor in, a, in an unholy mess. It, you know, if, if you dig a little deeper into the, into the pulse of the profession, you, they, they've got this great bit of research about the most successful portfolios. So these are portfolios that uh, are sort of in the, the top 10% or so of performers. Whether you look at you know, how often they deliver projects on time, or on budget or on target, you know, hitting the business goals. You know, they, they hit the goal about 90% of the time, right? Yeah, it's a little bit above for mm-hmm. one, a little bit below for another, but it's, it's about 90% of the time. Um, and if you look at the worst performers, it's about a third of that. You know, they're, they're hitting mm-hmm. the goal about a third of the time. So, so the average, we know the average is 60 odd, you know, 60, 65. And the best performers are 90 and the worst are 30, right? Ball, ballpark. So what's that? telling us it tells us that there's something the worst guys aren't doing well right so then they haven't got the project management message yet is the story i think there yeah the guys in the middle have got the project management you know they've got the methodologies and we've, you know, we're executing projects reasonably well but they haven't got the portfolio story yet and but the top guys are doing both they're doing good project management and good portfolio management and actually there was a, a line in in it wasn't very detailed but there was a line in the the uh, PMI data, PMI report, that, that said that was the difference. They said, you know, the thing that sets these top performers apart is that they really take the portfolio management as seriously as they take the execution, the project management. And that's, that, I think, is a really, a really important thing for PMO leaders to take away because so, so, many, so many PMOs um, don't necessarily have the support or the remit to go and do portfolio management. You know, the P is right. the small P, not the big P. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I, always, I always feel that's a real, I always think that's a real missed opportunity. I don't know, what's, what's your experience of that? Well, we find uh, similar results just you know, anecdotally from what we capture out there with our clients as well. It's, um, you know, we also get from PMI that the, one of the biggest contributors to project success is an engaged sponsor. Well, if we're not engaging the sponsors up front at the decision-making point where we're approving projects into the portfolio and activating them, well, then we've lost them at the beginning. We lost them at the decision point, right? Um, so the organizations who are more successful that we found uh, when we go in and work with them, is if we can get them to participate in the decision-making process, own the scope, own the budget, own those components, they're engaged in the actual execution of the project. But if we don't capture them up front, they disengage and, and disassociate for the duration of the project. So I, I do agree with you. I think there is a nice uh, reflection or connection, rather, there between the portfolio and the project and the success that we can show you know, to be honest, until you started saying it, I didn't think about it. I didn't put two and two together. But as you were describing it, I said, "Man, that's a light bulb moment for me." Well, well I mean, we can we can dig into that a little bit, Joe. So, so let, let, let's look at projects that fail. Right. So, in your experience, what what are some of the big the big causes of failure? Well, certainly, scope creep, right, is always at uh, near the top of the list. And of course, as I just mentioned, when sponsors aren't engaged, I also think that. When project managers haven't been trained appropriately on how to lead people, right? It's not just the technical skills of building a project schedule. It's how to motivate and influence people. When an organization hasn't really decided to invest in the project, certainly they've approved the project, but have they invested like we would do if we had a stock portfolio? We're, we're gonna, we're not just gonna yeah. buy it and let it sit on the shelf. We're gonna be invested. I, I, I put those near the top of my list. How about yourself? No, I, I think that's I think that's there. Uh, I, I think one of the other ones that I always hear is um, lack of resources. Um, you know, that's always kind of the the go to, you know, the go to reason. Now, now the reason I asked you that question is because um, I wanted to dig one level deeper, right? So, so yeah, we we didn't we didn't rehearse this. So, so that was, <laughs> right, that was, that's your list. That's not my list. So, so let's, let's look at those. If we look at scope creep, why does scope creep happen? Well, 
people often will kind of just wave their arms around and say, oh, well, we didn't have a good, you know, scope management process. Okay, well, wait, 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 wait. What does that mean? What that really means is that you don't know why you're doing the project and you're not disciplined enough to do the things that, that you're trying to achieve, you know, to focus on the goals of the project and, and to see, you know, and to focus on the tasks and the features and the, you know, so forth that will help you achieve. And very often the reason for that, right, we're, we're kind of doing a herringbone diagram here, right? Each time we answer yeah. a question, we say, why? Right. right. So, so why is that? Well, well, it's because we don't know why we're doing the project because that never came up in the whole project selection process. We never really made that clear in the governance meeting where we selected the projects, and we certainly didn't make it clear to the team at kickoff precisely why we're doing this, what the goals are. And, and, and so is it a big surprise that they couldn't then keep the thing on track? No, of course not. So, so the root cause of that, one root cause of that, there are probably several, but one root cause of that is the fact that they don't have a really clear picture of what this project is for, what's the strategic intent. And that word strategic, I suspect, is going to come up a lot in the next five minutes. That scope creep, right? That, that, it, sort of comes, it comes back to this strategic intent. So let's, let's think about your second one, which was sponsors. Why is the sponsor not engaged? Well, sometimes it's because they haven't been trained. They don't know they're meant to be engaged. I would actually suggest that the main reason is that the sponsor is just not interested in your project. So why? Let's keep going with the herring bones, right? Just keep doing why, why, why. So why are they? Why is she not not interested in the project? Because it's the wrong project, right? Right. The project isn't support. The project isn't supporting the strategic goals, the the long term goals of the business. And you know, the project probably got in there because somebody had a bad week. A customer shouted at them, and so they said, "I want a project to fix the thing that customer shouted about." Uh, even though, yeah, you know, it had nothing to do with the strategy of the business or the, their overall goals. It was just so I didn't get shouted at. And and you know what? Two months later, they don't even remember that happened. The extreme example of this, we had a customer well, several years ago now. When we started talking to them, they had um, 80% of their portfolio, 8-0, 80% of their portfolio was tagged as number one top priority. Got to have it tomorrow. <laughs> Right. So the so the reason that the PMO came to us was he, he said, oh, I, I can't work. I, I don't know how to allocate resources because everything is top importance. Right? So we we dug into it and we discovered that actually 40 percent of their portfolio was obsolete. Right? It wasn't it wasn't that it wasn't well aligned. It was actually obsolete. Oh boy. So you know, a good chunk of. A good chunk of those projects that were absolutely must have it tomorrow top priority were actually obsolete. The need had just gone away and they were still working on them. So so it's not a big surprise that your sponsor's not turning up to meetings or not invested in your project if it's not a project that they care about and that their peers care about. You know, if it's a project that every time, you know, if I'm a VP and every time I see the CEO, in, you know, in the executive washroom, and I'm washing my hands, and see, you know, there's the flushing noise. The door opens, the CEO steps out, and he says, "Ah, Stuart, what about that project?" Well, yeah, I'm going to make damn sure that project happens, right? If it is, in, you know, if it's that important that every you know, that everyone wants to know what, in, you know, that's going to have an impact on the business. I want to know that it's going to work. So, so again, that's about are the projects actually supporting the goals, the strategic intent of the organisation? Let's see, what else did you have? PMO is not trained on leadership. I don't think I can link that back to strategic intent. So you got me on that <laughs> one. But, but not committed to the, to the project. I mean, it's the, same, it's the same thing. That's what we just talked about. So that commitment is all about that strategic intent. And, and again, you know, when, when, you, when you talk about you know, the one that I threw in, the resources one, um, which that, that, by the way, is the most common discussion we have with people. You know, they come to us and they say, we just, we don't have enough resources for the projects we have. And, and I, I, you know, my, my, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, a very wise gentleman down in Brazil, gave me this nugget the other day. He said, Stuart, they don't have too many projects. What they have is a lack of focus. If they knew which projects were the ones that actually added value, then you could just right-size the portfolio and deliver it. 
you know, just stop doing the projects that aren't adding value, and suddenly you've got all the resources you need. If you look at project failures, lots, I'm not going to say every cause of project failure, but lots of those causes of project failure actually come about because of portfolio level, strategic alignment, resource alignment type issues. And there were, I'm, I'm going to stop ranting in a second, I promise. Um, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, there was some really cool research came out of uh, Australia a year or two ago. Uh, I think it was University of New South Wales or somewhere. And they were looking at the causes of project failure. And it was a wonderful academic paper. You know, I don't want to put too much weight on it where, you know, they, they spent the first 20 pages debating what failure meant. Uh, the next 20 pages debating what the project was and then drew some conclusions at the end. But, but the conclusions that they drew were that, that 40% of the causes of project failure happen before the kickoff meeting. You know, it's about resource allocation. It's about commitment to action. It's about, uh, it's about prioritization and, and, uh, uh, and, and planning. You know. So, so if, you, if you are ignoring that portfolio level stuff, then you are, your projects are failing and, and they're failing in a predictable way and an avoidable way. So there you go, rent over. Yeah, I, 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 there's not much to disagree with them there. And I'll, I'll, let me throw, again, unrehearsed, uh, I'll throw something back in and get your thoughts on this would be, I agree, we, we fail before we begin. But part of that, I think, is we bring the people to the projects as opposed to the projects to the people. So we're saying we don't have enough resources because we're trying to take this, in many cases, infinite pool of projects to a finite pool of resources, as opposed to saying, like they do in the military, right? I mean, you're assigned to a squad or, or whatever it may be, and you get a mission and you go get it as a team. They don't pick one person from that team, one person from that team, another person from another team like we do in the corporate world where our project teams become unique and we bring people who've never worked together before, ask them to form and storm and norm and become a team with a project manager who may never have worked with them before and give them a temporary project that they may or may not care about because it may not be involved in their merit increase that they want to get a bonus at the end of the year. Reverse that thought process. Say if we executed projects like the military where it's a dedicated team, we bring the project or the mission to them, they trust each other, they're committed to each other, they're committed to the cause. Their commander has told them what the mission is, but doesn't tell them how to do it, pulls the process out of the way, empowers them to go execute the mission because they're the boots on the ground, they know how to get the job done because we trust you, we've trained you. And now you get better success because you've got work uh, coming to uh, the people as opposed to people coming to yeah. the work. Uh, what's your thoughts on that? I mean, it's right now it's again, purpose driven PMO is kind of my mantra that I carry with me. And now the, the phase B of that is this empowering people. And part of that is putting them into teams where they can be successful as opposed to forming teams that are doomed for failure on a flip of a coin while the project work, because it's for all the factors you just mentioned, right? What's your thoughts on all of that? No, I mean, I, I think you, you, your insight is, is really strong. So uh, we have one customer at the moment where I, I'm going to try and phrase this in a way that it would be, it would be absolutely impossible for you to figure out who they are. So there's, there's one customer at the moment that it's a, a very large corporate and it's a, it's a, they've got projects that last multiple years and span multiple departments. So they literally have projects that are initiated way over here on the left that get tossed over a wall to a group in the middle who kind of do something with it, kill a few of them, and then toss them over a wall to, to another group, uh, another set of teams who, who deliver them. And there is absolutely no continuity, no vision, no understanding of what's going on. So, um, so it's very difficult for those people and and this is this is the thing that you know it, it gets it gets harder as you climb the corporate ladder it, it does get harder to remember that when you look at a balance sheet when you look at the PL statement 
There may be numbers, but those numbers are generated by human beings doing things. Yeah. Right? And the quality of those human beings, the effectiveness of those human beings is what affects those numbers. And uh, I think it was Peter Drucker said uh, something along the lines of culture beats strategy every time. Right? So, so you can have the best strategic senior leader, but if they set the wrong culture with the wrong people, then they will fail. So you know, that's true at the corporate level. I think it's true at the divisional level. It's true at the team and the delivery level. As an, so as a crazy example, um, I, I, we are going to have to share the video, I think, because I'm going to refer to this picture behind me. Um, All right. So uh, I don't know if you can, you, you can see that, Joe. Um, yep, so it's, it, it, it's a picture. It's kind of stylized picture of sunflowers for anyone who's, who, who's not on the video. Stylized pictures and some flowers. There are lots of kind of swirls and lots of different colors and lots of little spaces where those colors are, are, are um, filled in. It's very intricate. That picture was created by an incredibly talented artist who is registered blind. Oh, wow. Okay. When she, when she creates her art, her face, you know, she can just make out kind of shapes and outlines and things like that. And so, you know, she literally creates art two inches from her nose. And creating something like this would take her, you know, a month or two. I am biased because she's my niece. Uh, go, check her out on, go check her out on Instagram. Her name is Emma Easton. And she creates the most amazing artwork. And she does it so slowly, so painstakingly. That's what human beings do. They solve problems. Right. She could so easily have just kind of curled up and said, you know, forget it all. But she loves, she loves art. So she's found ways to deliver it. And that's what people do. If you give them, as you, as you put it, if you give them the mission and you give them permission to go and do it, then they will go and do it. Coming back to that portfolio thing, what good portfolio management does is it gives a mission to the portfolio. And part of that is giving a mission to each project so that, so that you have a, a, a real clear understanding of, of you know, what that project is for. So cra crazy anecdote. Sorry, I'm full of, full of this kind of you know, silly I stories and things. So you know, crazy anecdote, 1997, I think it was. I joined a company in Boston. Uh, actually, they were in Cambridge. They were, in, they were just over the bridge in, in Cambridge, yeah. uh, Massachusetts. We were, uh, and they foolishly put me in charge of their two biggest accounts. It was in, tel in, in the telco space. And it was a kind of company where they took young, bright people, and they just said, here, take 10 times more responsibility than you deserve. I'm sure you'll be fine. Right? And then they just shove you out the door and off you go. And, and by and large, we, we, we did pretty well. So anyway, uh, I, I had these, the, the two biggest accounts, the two biggest accounts in the world. Just before I joined, they, they just sold a new deal. So we were going to implement this huge new system. It was about 13, one, three, 13 million dollar, uh, project, which back in 97, that's, that's a lot of money. That's a big problem. And yeah. so I, I kind of went down. I had no background in project management. I didn't have much background in software. I didn't really know what I was doing. So I thought, I'm going to go, I'm going to, I'm going to sit in this kickoff meeting and I'm going to listen. I'm going to learn about the business issues, about the technology, about project management. And, and our, our project manager was a little nervous about this, you know, this, this crazy guy coming in. He's like, Stuart, you are going to just keep quiet. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I promise. Absolutely. The customer's project manager stood up and, and sort of did the dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to replace this billing system. I'm sitting there and going, oh, that doesn't seem right. I mean, there's a mission, that doesn't seem right. So up went the hand. You know, my, 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 you know, my project manager, you, know, you could hear his head hit the table. He's like, oh, God, what's he doing? What's he doing? I mean, we're 30 seconds into the meeting and he's interrupted right? this new idiot. And I said, I, I don't think we are here to replace a billing system, are we? I know you're spending a lot of money to replace a billing system, but that's not what we're here to do. We're here to grow revenue, aren't we? Isn't that the goal of this activity? 
And they all looked at me like I was an absolute, you know, like I'd just landed from Mars or something. And and the executive sponsor was in the room, and he kind of stood up and went, yes, you're absolutely right. That's precisely why we're here. And it changed the whole direction and tenor. And it was completely accidental. It was just me being an idiot. I didn't know any better. Right? Um, but, but it changed the whole direction and tenor of the meeting, of the kickoff meeting which then affects the whole direction and, and kind of the culture, if you like, of the, of the project itself. So I think that idea of you know, framing the mission correctly, whether you're at the portfolio level or at the project level, is, is so important if you, because if you have a good, a clear mission, you can manage scope. If you have a clear mission that matters, people are going to support you. If you're going to stay engaged, you're going to get the resources you need. You're going to get the decisions made by the executives. So it's all tied together. You know, so so executing well isn't enough. You also have to have the mission clearly stated, and that's what that is. What project prioritization is all about. Well, yeah, and that's you know goes back to purpose driven PMO in the presentation, right? The little P versus the big P. The client project manager was referring to little P, right? I mean, yeah, that's what you were doing, but that's not why you were doing big P, right? Was to drive revenue, and when we align people to the big P. Uh, we find we can move mountains, right? We can do whatever we want as people when we align to the right purpose. So great so why example. Do you, so why do you think, I mean, you spent a lot of time thinking about this, Joe. Um, so why do you think people focus on the little P? Well, I'm going to probably get a lot of hate mail for this. For us. <laughs> but, the, but I think there's a, a big majority of the people and organizations today that, that go to work to go to work. They, they they just go, they need to collect the paycheck, they want to come home, they want to be with their family, and their big P is their family life, right? It's not what they do at work. So at work, they're okay with just tell me what I need to do to get my job done so I can punch the clock out and go home uh, and be with my family. I'm not trying to disparage them, but I, it's the observation that we get from a lot of uh, organizations these days. So it's easy to track them to the little P. Right. Just just I'm going to put my head down and tell me what we need to do. But that doesn't work for the entire organization because there's many people that are still in the organization that are looking for that big P. And we don't have leaders today that have been trained and well versed on how to communicate the big P. Right. We don't uh, communicate down like we do across. Right. Uh, the executives in their boardroom share the big P mission but then don't bring that big P mission down to the lower parts of the organization through the different layers. So it's kind of like the telephone game, right? As, as you go from the source yeah. of the conversation to the final conversation, we lose the meaning. We lose the purpose of that call. And I don't think we train our PMO leaders, especially I'm a hundred percent certain of this. We're not training them with the tools of how to communicate and lead their team in what we're doing with purpose. You know, one person's opinion, I don't know if it's right or wrong, but it's certainly based on a lot of evidence we get from the clients we work with. Yeah, and that's, that's a really interesting point. And, and um, you know, I, 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 I don't know if you're going to agree with this, but anyone who's in the position where, where they go to work every day and they're focused on the little P and they're, they're mostly in it for the paycheck and, and for the pride that comes with having a job and providing for family and all that kind of stuff. You know, it's not just the paycheck. There's, there's all that. Uh, other stuff wrapped up in it, but who aren't really passionate about the work, I, I say this, change jobs, or at least change role in your job or something, because because a lot of, I, I think a lot of that comes down to, and you use this word, leadership, it comes down to leadership. A crazy example was um, I, I spoke to somebody at a large telco, let's leave it there, let's not go any more specific than that. And, uh, and she was just a coder, right? And she'd worked there for 10 years. Not one line of code that she had written had gone into production. Oh, Not a goodness. single line of code in 10 years. So what does she feel like? You know, when, when somebody says, can you stay late and finish this project? What is she, what's her response to that? No, no, I'm going to go home and I'm going to, because, right? so the only thing she's got to look, you know, she, she knows anything she's working on is, is worthless because it's not going to go into production. 
So the only thing that she does have to value is, is that family life. So, of course, that's going to be the center. That's a lack of leadership. It's a lack of being able to connect the dots between you know, the strategic, strategic vision, the actions that you need to take to achieve that strategic vision, and the culture that you need to allow people to flourish and to develop and to, to be productive. And you know, one of the, I mean, I don't, I don't want to turn this into a, an advert for our software, but one of the things that, that the, the software is actually built on a whole bunch of decision science research. Okay, so it's, it's not something that we made up. It's not something that lots of people say work well. It's stuff that research has been done to determine that it works well. Right, and, and why it works well. And one piece of that is that it, it's about getting people aligned. So if you're going to align, you know, within a project, if you're going to align your activities with the goal of the project, you need to know what the goal of the project is. To, to know which projects to do, you need to know what the goals of the portfolio are. To, to know what the goals of the portfolio are, right, the strategic goals of the portfolio, you need to get your the strategic layer of your organization aligned. Now, most people kind of assume most most PMOs, uh, PMO leaders that I talk to, kind of assume that because the executives lock themselves in a room for two and a half hours to pick a portfolio of projects, that means they're the one that they are they are the right projects and that they are aligned with our strategy. No, it doesn't. All it means is that someone in that room was persuasive enough or powerful enough to get their projects approved. That's all it means. So those projects may or may not bear any resemblance to the, to the strategy. So, right, I'm going to start banging you with some statistics now. So some really interesting research done on government departments in the Middle East. And they looked at the overall effectiveness of those departments, right? So basically, did they achieve their goals? Did they provide good services to the to the populace and so on. Uh, so they looked at the effectiveness of the department and they looked at the degree of strategic alignment, right? So were they doing things that supported their goals? It turns out that strategic alignment explains 85% of the variability between the good departments and the bad departments, right? So it's a, you know, by far and away the strongest predictor of good performance. Research study the, in a different domain and they came up with the number of about 90% uh, explaining power. The you know, strategic alignment explains the difference between the good and the bad. So this thing, you know, strategic alignment, is, is crucially important to achieving your goals. And yet most organizations, you know, when, when, when the leadership team say, here's our strategy, right? they say, here's our mission, here's our vision, you know, you've got two levels below them, they have no idea what they're meant to do with that. Uh, it's a statement about we're going to be a world leader in marshmallow flavored chocolate cereal, right? Well, what do I do with that today? Right. Yeah. Like, what action do I take that contributes to that? Uh, so, so one of the things that, that our software helps them do is take that kind of take this group of people at the senior leadership team, and it kind of forces them to have a discussion that, that comes out and that very clearly states, in a very structured way, states, you know, these are the few things that, we're really ca- that we really care about. So it's, you know, it's customer satisfaction or you know, driving down cost or whatever it is, right? whatever those key drivers are of the business. And it, and it puts numbers on it. It says, you know, this one... You know, we're going to have three or four goals that we're going to use as criteria to drive all the action in the organization. And the weighting on those goals tells you how important that, that is. Now, suddenly, as someone, in the, someone you know, five layers down in the organization, I can look at that and I can say, oh, you mean the most important thing to us is customer satisfaction? Well, I can think of three things we can do tomorrow to improve customer satisfaction. But nobody's ever, nobody's ever told me that before. Right. So, so, so suddenly, you know, your organization's thinking differently. Instead of thinking in terms of, you know, what, what, you know, who kicked me in the backside yesterday? And so what, you know, what project shall I, shall I request to try and fix that? They're thinking about what are the strategic goals of the organization? And what are the things I can do, my team can do, my department can do? 
to to have an impact on that. And um, and so so it really becomes a circular thing that you know if you if you can still that that sort of discipline that communication it's just communication it's about getting the leaders aligned to talk and 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 then communicating that down once you get that, that communication working then those people who are just turning up to collect the paycheck and, and i know it's more than that so we're just using that as a, as a label right yeah but those yeah. people those those people who are just turning up to collect a paycheck feel like actually there is a cause here there is a big p there is a big p in, in purpose, that, that, that what I do matters because I can see the link between those strategic goals and, and what what I do. And, you know, I, I think that's tremendously, tremendously important. I mean, whenever whenever I onboard people here at, at Transparent Choice, we talk about, yeah, you know, we do project prioritization and decision-making software, right? That's, that's the what. But the why is impact, I and mean, it's where we started. It's about impact. It's about people not wasting their lives on 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 you know, executing stuff that's wasteful. It's about uh, eliminating waste. It's about government departments delivering good value by investing in the stuff that adds value for the population, rather than pet projects. You know, the bridge to nowhere or whatever. You know, pick your favorite pet project. So it's about all of those things. And even if even if it's just about helping companies save a bit of money, who owns those companies? We do. Yeah. We own those companies. That, that's my pension. That, you know, that's 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 my health insurance. That's you know, that that money. Yeah, you know, that that's my money. So helping those companies be more efficient is about helping me be better. Now suddenly that's personal and that feels good. And if if more people kind of thought that way. And, and join the dots. I think. I think number one, we get a heck of a lot more stuff done because we put up a lot more focus. <laughs> and um, but number two, I think we'd all enjoy it more. Well, I think the we are learning a lesson from the generation coming after us, right? The the millennials in their pursuit of purpose in their lives and their work, whereas the generation that we preceded or, or followed, rather, um, our parents. Post war, we're trying to establish the the family unit and a bit of normalcy after, right? Having gone through uh, World War II, followed by Vietnam and, and Korea and others. But now we're far enough away from that that the the youth are saying, "I want to go work somewhere where I can make a difference." And imagine if the leadership team takes that person that's coming in with that passion, and then doesn't give them a passion to follow doesn't give them a purpose to pursue, but just says, there's your cubicle, sit over there, write code for 10 years, and we're never going to use that code. I mean, what a waste, right, that we had an opportunity to be able to take the, the an employee and, and use their own internal motivation of what they want to do, but didn't give them the leadership to go pursue it. So, uh, absolutely. so what do we do? How do we get, how do we change that? I mean, how... We recognize it, but that's maybe the easy part. The hard part is making change. Yeah, and, and I think I think a part of um, honestly being humble enough to acknowledge that there's a problem. You know, it's it's really difficult, uh, especially for senior leaders, actually, to to acknowledge that there's a problem. So, you know, our, our software helps people make better decisions. Right, and usually it's about a portfolio or something, but it could be about you know, selecting a vendor or you know whatever you know the site for an airport. You know, we've done all of those things as well. And so, if you go to a if you go to a C suite executive and say, "Hey, we've got this software that helps people make better decisions," nine times out of ten, the answer you get back is, "But I'm in the C suite. I'm here because I know how to make decisions. Please don't get me don't misinterpret this." The people in the C-suite are really generally very, very smart people, very, very motivated people, very experienced people. And, you know, so I, I don't, I'm not denigrating them. But I think the message out there is that, um, uh, you know, even the, you know, or, or tease, right? So even, even world-class athletes strive every day to improve. That's right. And, and I'm not convinced that enough 
senior leaders. I don't want to paint them all with the same brush right, by any, any stretch of the imagination. But I, I think sometimes as, they get, you know, as you get higher in an organization, you start to feel kind of bulletproof almost. And, you for, and, and it's very easy to forget. So, so I think that humility is really important, just kind of grasping humility. Within the PMO, what can we do? Which is probably more relevant for this audience. Uh, I, I think the, the answer is to look for, or an answer, is to look for the, the impact, uh, you know, the business results that come from this. So, you know, it's a failed project. So in the Sundown report, don't just sit there and say, oh, we failed because we didn't have enough resources. Sit there and say, we didn't have enough resources because you guys picked too many projects. And the reason you picked too many projects is because you couldn't tell which were the important ones and which weren't. So we need to go and fix prioritization. Right? And, and take it from something failed to a root cause and a, and a solution. Right? And, and I think... Again, not uh, there are PMO leaders who step up and do that every day, but but a lot of PMO leaders will sit there and, and they're really you know they're, they're keeping the books. They're not really leading, uh, and and leadership is about setting a direction, overcoming problems, taking taking responsibility for things, and, and making sure that the, the results happen. Uh, but you can only do that with the support of your leadership. So I don't know. What, what's your what are your thoughts? Well, I agree with that. And uh, one of the, the gaps or holes we have in our industry, I believe, is we do a pretty good job at training project managers to be PMs. I've yet to see a concerted effort in the industry to train our PMO leaders to be leaders. That's one one of the driving forces yeah. behind the purpose-driven PMO that we're doing and, and empowering people to deliver results is to try to train the PMO leader that um, you're not the project manager that got promoted to manager. You're actually the lead of an important function within the organization that's delivering value back to the end customer because you're working on the most important things that the organization's doing, right? These are all unique projects that somebody has said yes to. If you're not a leader over the team that's doing that, the organization is going to fail in their delivery, right? So, what can right, we do as right. an industry to come back to those leaders and actually give them the leadership skills to run that department? And I think we as an industry, it's kind of the your um, light bulb moment for me earlier was the combining of the, the portfolio to the project to help us achieve better project results. Well, I think it's bring the leadership to the PMO to help achieve better project results as well. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Now, unfortunately, so, we've so, uh, covered what, a lot what, of... We, what? I was going to say we've we're running out of time. We've covered a lot of ground, but yeah. we're we're at our hour mark here. And I want to give you an opportunity to touch base on stuff, anything that we haven't been able to hit yet, and how people cool. can get in touch well, with you or anything you have upcoming. So, so get so get in touch with us. Yeah, if you're interested in in figuring out some of these issues around portfolio management and prioritization, um, head over to our, our website at transparentchoice.com. Um, at, at the moment, we have uh, an offer going where we're, we're kind of giving away our software to any organization that can convince us that giving them software for free will have a meaningful impact on the COVID crisis, right? We want to try and help reduce the economic and the social impact. Right. So, uh, so if you're in an organization where you think you can have a meaningful impact, let us know, and there's some free software waiting for you there. And, and speaking of COVID, I... I it's funny how there's nothing new under the sun. I, I discovered a, a law in London uh, that, that must be quite an old law because the law says that it is illegal if you have the plague, the Black Death. It's illegal <laughs> to hail a taxi and get into the taxi. And it, and it made me wonder, right? So I, I see the rationale behind that law, right? I understand that. So it made me wonder what, what kind of laws you've got in Arizona. So here's one for you, Joe. I, all so right. did you know that in, in Arizona, it is a class one misdemeanor to deliberately trip up a horse. <laughs> and you can, you can spend 48 hours in jail if you're convicted. So can you explain that law and where it came from in the next 10 seconds that we've got left? <laughs> Unfortunately, I can't. 
I don't know if I would want to get that close to Triple Horse because I'm afraid he'd kick me, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, I, before I moved to Phoenix, uh, I lived in a, uh, a small town just outside Atlanta called Kennesaw, Georgia. And in Kennesaw, Georgia, it was a law that every home had to own a handgun. So uh, within the state of Georgia, the lowest crime rate within the state of Georgia was in the town of Kennesaw, Georgia, because the criminals were afraid that every homeowner had a handgun. So, yes, there's all these obscure laws uh, that we probably nobody knows about, right? Uh, But, Stuart, thank you so much for being on the the show today. I really appreciate it. And covering uh, so much ground about portfolios and the strategic alignment, giving me a light bulb moment that I had never uh, really put together. I certainly appreciate that. And I'll also plug Emma Easton once again, right? Um, And it looks like an amazing artist. I can see her artwork. So go to Emma Easton on Instagram see the work she's done and enjoy that artwork is what I'm looking at right now is beautiful. And I can't believe it was done by somebody who's legally blind. Fantastic work, <laughs> Emma. Yeah. Uh, so thanks so much for being on the show. Uh, I also want to thank our thank listeners, you. right? It's great for them to be Absolutely. able to keep coming back to us uh, for all the shows. Be sure to visit projectmanagementofficehours.com. Check out all the great content we have there. We've got, uh, a great lineup of guests coming up in the coming weeks, Lee Lambert, Jesse Fuel, Cornelius Fickner, and more. A reminder that all of these shows are also being recorded, so be sure to subscribe to Project Management Office Hours on your favorite podcast platforms such as uh, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Spotify Spreaker, whatever your choice is. And of course, thank you to our sponsors, the PMO Squad, Visit www.thepmosquad.com. Learn more about the purpose-driven PMO and empowering people to deliver results. So that's it for now. Office hours are closed. Until next time, I'm PMO Joe, and you've been listening to Project Management Office Hours. (laughs) 